All right, a good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. A good afternoon also to those of you on the West Coast. I'm your host, Brandon Troy, host as well as co-creator of Movers and Shakers Unlimited. And thanks so much for joining us wherever you're watching from, whether it's live or elsewhere. Um, if you have been taking a look at the promos that we have been running today, you'll know that we have an awesome show on uh, tap for you guys. Uh, so let me, without further ado, hop right into what we are doing for today's show. So um, the person that I am welcoming back on the show needs no introduction. They are known, of course, for their daytime Emmy Award winning uh, role uh, in Take This Lollipop. And also, which we will be discussing today, as you can see, um, their you know, unforgettable role as the unsub in CBS's Criminal Minds in the Blood Relations episode from season nine, episode 20. Um, and we're also going to be talking about, of course, their unforgettable role as Papa Corn in uh, Circus of the Dead, among many others. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show, Bill Aubers Jr. Bill, how are you doing, sir? I feel like my head is huge, friend. <laughs> You're, good. You're good. I apologize for my frame. Like this is the frame I always seem to end up in and stuff. They're always I hear people talking and they're always like, yeah, like just like getting from the chin to just the crown of his head. And then they'll light up your eyes. And then all you have to do is say, Brandon, are you there? And there you go. <laughs> How are you well doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, as I said, you know, welcome. It, it's been a minute. We were just talking about it, you know, uh, uh, off stage, so to speak. And and it's you know, it's good to have you back. Um, thank you. I want to thank you for what you continue to do for this industry. I mean, you are a pros pro, and you really help those of us who are not, you know, on the A list. Stop it. Stop. Stop. Get exposed Stop. <laughs> and talk about and uh, give credibility to the stuff we do. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Um, and it's my pleasure, like I said, to have you have you on board and, and to, you know, talk about uh, awesome, you know, uh, uh, components of, you know, your filmography and, and what you, you know, what, what you've accomplished, you know, within your your career. So um, as I said, in talking about today's show, you know, I wanted to be able to celebrate the anniversary of two, you know, unforgettable roles that you had. As I said, first, you know, we can dive into Criminal Minds, but a little later, I want to also dive into uh, uh, Circus uh, of the Dead, which both, and it's hard to believe, it's it'll be close, close to, as of this year, we'll be coming up on 10 years, 10 year anniversary of both of those roles, which is pretty- That's right. We actually shot Circus in 2013. It was released in 14, and Criminal Minds was shot and aired in 14. Absolutely, and I apologize. It is a live show, so yes, you do hear a little minor stuff in the background, but hopefully it will die down. But uh, hopping right into you know Criminal Minds, can you you know talk a bit about that episode and and you know getting into the mindset of that character? Uh, in, in terms of, of the unfortunate um, uh, origins of, of that character. So first I got to tell you how I got the role. Yes, please. Well, this is, it's a really hierarchical business. Um, you know, you tell people, what do you do? Uh, I'm an actor. Oh, have you been in anything I might've seen? Right. You know, they'll always hit you with that. And even if you're like, oh yeah, you know, I was in, like criminal minds what season oh we didn't watch that season i mean the people have really like lay you on the grill and it's the same way inside the business when it comes to casting so this role came out and i was invited to audition for it and so i did my audition for the casting director and then i get called back for the network audition um, and this was 10 years ago so everything wasn't strictly virtual then everything was still like in the room, hands on. We really had not gone to video auditions. So in the room there, there's the director, Matthew Gray Gubler, who was a member of the cast as well, playing Dr. Reed. And sure. there's Breen Frazier, who wrote this episode, who was a founding producer on Criminal Minds. And then there's all of these other people. I have no idea who they were, but there must have been 20 people in the room there. And extremely intense audition. Um, 
I mean, the director gets like right in your face, like truly in your right here. And so we did this scene, we did it several times. It was in a big open room, not at all your traditional, thank you very much, you know, we'll see you. It was like very intense. And when we finished, um, Gubler, Matthew Gray Gubler said, he said, Bill, no matter what happens, I want to thank you for coming in and for what you did today. And I was like, oh, you know, I didn't get it. That's, that, that generally means, you know, you're not going to get it. And then I got a call from him. He got my cell phone number and he called and he said, I want you to do it. Uh, and I want you to do it without a shirt and wear suspenders. That was a whole nother deal. It was like, oh my God, are you serious? So, but when I got on set, he said, I want to tell you that I have tried to cast you three times before for episodes. And I said, oh, really? And they said, yes, each time you were killed by the ubiquitous, I've never heard of him. So on a network level, at least back then, networks were still at the very tail end of being king 10 years ago. You could be killed even if everybody else in the room wanted to cast you. If one person said, I never heard of him. Boom. That's the end of it. I said, how'd you get me in this one? He said, well, it's a horror themed episode. We had Adrian Barbeau. We had Tobin Bell. They knew them and they said, well, OK, you can have your guy. So that's how I got the role. And it turned out to be tremendously helpful for me and for my career. It sure. got me indoors that I wouldn't have got in otherwise. But it's such a hierarchical business that the only way that I got in was that there were other people that they instantly knew that were in the episode and they were like, okay, well, you can have him too. So I was sort of the add on. Oh, man, man. Well, it, can, can you just talk also about just the, what was necessary to, to do the role? I mean, I know that I understand that there were uh, uh, physical, you know, um, uh, additions that, you know, I guess yeah. helped to get into the, to the character. So can you yeah. talk a bit about that? And then also, I know that there was that other added component with to really show the disfigured uh, nature of that character that there was another actor used to stunt your hands, I believe. Yes, that's right. Oh. So to begin with, my hands in the episode are not my hands. Right. The hands of a gentleman who played for the NFL for years and years and years. And most of his bones in his hands had been broken and reset. And, you know, some were crooked. And so those were his hands. Now he was black. I'm white. So his hands were done up in white makeup. So I had a black NFL player's hands play in my hands. And for me, for my little hands, they just put gloves on them. So that's why I had these big bulky gloves. The makeup artist was Christopher Allen Nelson. So Christopher did all of Tarantino's makeups. You know, I don't know when they stopped working together. May, they may still be, but he did all the Kill Bills. He, in fact, he was the groom in the original Kill Bill. He's an actor as well as a makeup artist. So I got in Christopher's chair and he started talking about the look of the character. I'm supposed to be a product of incest between Adrian Barbeau and Tobin Bell. And he said, you know what I want to do? I want to make this an homage to sort of the Lon Chaney characters, the wounded monster. I'd really just about cried, Brandon, because that's the gold standard for me is, you know, Phantom of the Opera, Quasimodo, the, the monster who's a monster in part because you made him a monster. And sure. so we wanted to make him heartbreaking as well as scary so he, he wanted to do some things and he wanted he said I, I want something weird on like he did a they did a brow piece which criminal minds paid for cbs would pay for that they didn't want to pay for teeth but he convinced the makeup artist the head of the makeup department to pay for the teeth so i had this uh plumper that you know did this and then he said you know what i got i i, I really want a big ear or something he said wait a minute so at the same time, he's working on American Horror Story, right? And there's the character Pepper, who's the, the we would call a pinhead with the big giant ears. Right. So the next day he comes in and he says, you may not tell anybody this until years have passed since this episode. So I guess years have passed. It's okay. So he got one of Pepper's ears from the Fox makeup department for American Horror Story. And he put it on me. Um, he, he said, do you not tell anybody that that's where that ear came from or I'll get in trouble. 
So every day for the shoot, he would meticulously, you know, create this ear and blend it so well that when the episode aired, my mother called and she said, what happened to your ear? I was like, mama, that's not my real ear. Um, so yeah, it was, and by the time you got in that makeup with the, the brow piece, the ear humped over really self-conscious already because, you know, I'm half naked on national television and got these silly suspenders on. And when they call you to set, you know, you really did feel like, like sort of like a monster. And then the crowning touch was Matthew Gray Gubler, who's a big fan of horror movies. He, he bless his heart. He gave me the best advice I've ever gotten. And he said, be gentle, be really, really gentle. And I would do the line and he would say even more gentle, like, like a baby. And so that's how he ended up saying, you never even thought about me, did you? It's interesting because it makes it, I feel like it makes it, that that choice makes it far more nerving than it does if you know you were if you were like going 100 percent full full out so right and most m most directors that i've worked with would say go full out but he wanted him gentle um and yeah so that's how that little guy i call him my little guy that's how he came about um the, the stunt that i did not get to do that i dearly wanted to and the stunt coordinator wanted me to do too that there's a gag where near the end my character comes up out of the water and grabs one of the team and tries to pull her back down and later on she's saying her hair smells like a dirty sock um and so I was going to do that we were shooting at the Disney ranch and way up the 14 outside of LA but network protocol at that time if you're going to put an actor in the water you have to do a bacteria test on the water and it was just a little high, like just on this, this side of normal, but it was on the high side. And so the network said, no, absolutely not, because they're afraid of, you know, lawsuits for health damages or something. But I was like, sure. please let me do this. Please, I really <laughs> want to. And the, the stunt coordinator was like, I really want you to, Bill, but I can't. So they got a body double to do that shot. So it was it was a really interesting experience for me the, my first experience with big network and yeah. networks aren't like that anymore they don't have the money that they had then but then that was the tail end of when if you worked a network shoot they had the money to do whatever the hell they wanted to do if they wanted to bring in a grilled cheese truck because it'd been a long day here comes the truck in from la you know you want to work longer you want to add shots add them go for it the, the adr the, the automated dialogue replacement most of the people watching your show probably know that most of the dialogue you see on movies when it's an action sequence is looped. You know, it's added later. But a lot of television is too, because you turn your head this way and it just doesn't catch the boom right. Right. The ADR session for this, the studio that it was in, it was huge, Brandon. It was a huge, like, indoor ADR studio, big as a, a movie screen. There's the episode running. The director is actually present with you, which never happens with ADR. It took as long to do the ADR. I think it took like two days just to do the few lines of ADR because they wanted them exactly perfect. There was a standard of quality there. I kind of miss, I kind of miss that the old network spend the money and create something that will make your jaw drop. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, uh, I will also give credit that your character actually, I'm not going to spoil, I'll try not to, well, I'll spoil it. It's been 10 years, guys. He gets away. So, like, and then he's one of the few that, that, that do get, you know. One of three. Yeah, that gets away. So, you know, was that always the intention or was that something that was, you know, decided later or was it always the, the idea that, no, this is going to be a character that, you know, they, will not, they won't catch by the end. It won't be a happy ending by the end. The, yes, that scene at the end was added after the original script came to me, the scene at the end, which is an odd scene because the, the guy's always been really gentle and all of a sudden he's kidnapping. You know, he's threatening to kill this guy. And I think that was just a way to make him escape with the thought that they would bring him back later and kill him. But I think the reason they didn't bring him back later, which, of course, I wanted them to, was that Criminal Minds fans were really split on this episode. I saw a lot of comments on message boards. It said, too scary, too scary, too scary, too dark. What are you doing? You know, um, too psychotic. 
too weird. They didn't like that. They don't want their unsubs that weird. And I think it was also because you felt sorry for him. And some people don't want to feel sorry. Yeah, for and that put them they probably really in a weird head space. Yeah. They want to hate him. So that's probably why, because although the network, they did a list of top criminal mind villains of all time. And my guy was like number four. And I was like, woohoo, they'll bring me back. But they never did. And I think that's probably the reason why. Got it. Got it. Got Anything it. that I touch turns like weird. <laughs> that's why I, I, I cannot get arrested in any kind of a role other than a weird role. Because when I'm on camera, it just ends up looking weird. I, I'll tell you one brief anecdote, if I may. Yeah, yeah, go for when it. I, so when I first got started, I came to L.A. in 08. Zero credits. Nothing. Nada. I'm trying to get started. And my manager, I had a long stage career. It was great, but that means nothing. So my manager says, well, okay, we're going to pitch you sort of this uh, soccer dad, you know, type. So I go for this audition, <laughs> and it's a dad. And um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to. That's okay. It's, it's, some, uh, it's like an energy drink. <laughs> And it's a it's Japanese energy drink. I, I just know it because dad. I know the roles that you've played, and it is just I'm trying to picture yeah. a soccer dad. So go ahead. Sorry. Thanks. The soccer dad who would eat the team. <laughs> so uh, um, it, I, I'm a I'm a dad at this table for this, and it's this commercial for this energy drink. And the the daughter, my daughter, really wants to be in the Olympics, and I'm like, you know, you know, with this, you you know, cut cut your show, whatever the name of this stuff was. You'll, you'll make it. And everybody's smiling. And so I do it. And then I get a note from the casting director that says, you were the best actor. And the client loves your acting, but the client is scared of your look. Mm. Can, can you send me the, the most benign headshot that you've got so I can try to convince him that you're not frightening? So I sent him the sweetest headshot I got where they did me up like a doctor with the stethoscope and looking in the camera and smiling. I sent it to the casting director and he wrote back three words, sorry, still scared. And I didn't get the role. And that oh. was the beginning of me realizing, okay, boy, if you're going to work, you're going to be scary. Yeah. So there it yeah. is. And I mean, I've, I've seen you've, you've played dads before. And so like, I, I mean, I've, I've seen you in that role. I'm, I'm just trying to, I, I have a complete, I, it, I'm just trying to picture soccer dad. And then I'm like, that, that would be an interesting take. That would be an interesting take on soccer dad. I'm, I'm well, for the, it. It'd be an interesting take. The camera's weird. Like it decides what you are. Yeah. And it doesn't love you if you're not that thing. Like it, like, like the planes and angles of this sort of a face, it really wants you. The camera wants you to be malevolent. It's begging for it. So, oh, I did a movie, uh, uh, I did a couple of Hallmark movies, uh, Amish love story things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in one of them, I'm, uh, I'm talking to my daughter, and I have a habit of not blinking. Um, because I read Michael Caine say, you know, don't blink and you're stronger. So I just got in the habit of going long times without blinking. So I'm talking to my daughter about, you know, you, you are my daughter. Do, do not get yourself be shunned, my dear. Blah, blah, you know, going on. I was never Right, blinking. right, right, right. And so um, the actress afterwards went over and whispered to Michael Landon Jr., who was the director, and he came over afterwards and he said, hey, Bill, he said, hey, you've, um, you know, whatever the actress name was, he said, you've got her feeling a, just, a, just a little bit creeped out, buddy, you know, just, just dial it back a little, just dial it back a little. So, yeah, everything I do turns creepy. <laughs> So I feel like that's a terrific segue <laughs> going into Circus of the Dead. Uh, it's funny that you, you know, um, that you were talking about how dark the character uh, of the unsub in uh, Criminal Minds was, considering the depravity of Papa Corn in, 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 in Circus of the Dead. So yes. uh, can you, you, you know, talk about talk about now getting into you know that getting getting that role and 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 yeah. get in that role so this is 2012 this is two years before criminal minds okay so i've i've done some things but i'm really still eating a lot of peanut butter and noodles you know what i mean yeah um and then but then god bless them i don't know who this is people can create all sorts of imbd lists you know 
Worst actors ever. I'm on one of those as number one. With like Claude Van Damme and Mike Myers and stuff like that. But this this IMBD list was actors to watch in 2012. Somebody created it. I don't know how they got my name on there, but I was um, among them. So Billy Pond, the director of Circus of the Dead, told me that he saw this list, actors to watch in 2012. And he said, hell, I'm going to pitch it to all the guys on this list. And I was one of the guys on that list. And that's how I ended that's up it. making contact with him. Um, and I did not understand this role at all. I thought he was a funny clown. Oh, he's a clown. He's going to kill people. It would be funny, but horrible. And Billy was like, no, no, no. That is not it at all. And when I finally got on set and got in the makeup with the little curly piece. Yep, little, I got it up now. <laughs> yeah. He, um, I kind of began to understand what Billy was talking about. Billy said he's a homicidal necrophiliac uh, serial rapist and murderer whose day job happens to be as a circus clown. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. So constantly, Billy was my muse on Circus of the Dead. There's a shot online of me getting ready to do a scene and I'm literally flat up against the wall and Pond has both hands on either side of my shoulder and he's nose to nose with me and he's talking to me and he was talking me into doing that scene, which was absolutely depraved. He had to talk me into the character many, many times. That's a tough character because for Papa Corn, there's no meaning anywhere. <laughs> so I, I was I was going to ask that because like, you know, I, I've seen the movie and like some of some of the things that that Papa Corn does in this film is like, I, I just have to ask you, like, how do you, you know, wrap your head around a lot of that stuff because a lot of times when you're playing villains, right? And I, I, you've, we, we've talked about it before when you've been on the show where, and then a lot of people say this and, and it's just the idea that if you're playing a villain, you know, you don't judge your, the, the villain that you're playing, you know, you are trying to understand, you know, that character. So that way it makes sense to you to be able to portray that character. You have to find something in that character to to have it make sense to humanize them but like just as we were saying like depraved like some of the things some of the things is just like jaw dropping that this character uh uh does with within the context of this film so like i i just have to ask like as an actor how do you wrap your head around that and have that well, or... Billy, Billy, Billy Pond challenged me. So here's what he said, man. He said, wow, Papa Corn does what men would do if there were no restraints. And that hit me because, you know, and I'm sure that's true for women as well, for, you know, I, but I'm a guy and and I know what goes on in a guy's head and I know the darkness as well as the potential for light. And I thought, you know what? I have to face the fact that what Pond just told me is true. A lot of what Papa does is what men and mankind would do if there were no restraints. So can I play this character as if he's me with no restraints? And that's what made it so dark and so scary. And that's why afterwards I didn't want to watch the movie uh, because it just convicted me. Every time I watched the movie was, you liked that. There's a part of you that liked it. And it's true. I couldn't have done it otherwise because when Papa says, yes, yes, Papa loves you. Papa will always love you. That can't just be like, oh, it's a little catchphrase. It has to come from somewhere deep inside. So there's a part of me that liked what Papa did and a large part of me that hates the fact that I could ever like what Papa did. It's that darkness that's in us. I think there's something rotten at the core of humanity. And what Billy Pond told me was get into the dark core where the, where the worms live and root around. 
Wow. <laughs> wow. So like, and, and then additionally to, to ask further about that, I mean, there are scenes in which, you know, you have other characters that are like witnessing, you know, what, what's, what's happening. So, you know, in speaking to that, can you talk also about just that idea of having other, you know, other actors there? And, and I mean, they're even, at, you know, scenes where like, you know, the kids of, are witnessing, you know, what's happening to their parents. So like, how how did that you know work in the context of having those actors there because i'm sure that that was like a rough day it's hard yeah it was as hard as doing a nude scene because you're emotionally completely exposed you don't have any defenses if you are there are people who are playing kids and you know and you're you you're attacking the mother and you have to do it. I've always believed that if you're going to play evil, you, I believe there is real evil. And so I think you owe it to the evil. You owe it to humanity to do it for real. And you're doing it for real. And there's the kids. And I've had actors on sets and on this one too, who've told me afterwards, I hate you. I hate you. I'll, I'll stop hating you, but I hate you because what I saw was so real. And yeah, it was kind of like that here. Like the actors avoid you afterwards. You know, once you decapitate someone's head and later copulate with the decapitated head, it's bound to color your, <laughs> uh, you know, your relationship with the actor. Okay. Wow. Um, and, you know, in, in speaking to that too, can you, um, you know, also get into similarly of what we have with, with criminal minds, just that idea that, it doesn't have, you know, the picket fence ending. I'm not going to spoil exactly what happens, but like, I, I think that's enough for me to say that it's not, it, it's not a picket fence, you know, typical ending. And no, and so, I, and I hated the ending when I read it and I yeah. kept thinking, well, he's going to change it. But yeah. what Pon, what Pon wanted to create was a world in which there is no hope, no hope. There's no yeah. hope of anything. And it floored me emotionally, Brandon. It just wiped me out because Papa Coin doesn't care. Right. He doesn't care. He runs roughshod over the last shred of hope that you have. He'll just stomp on it with his big clown feet. He right. doesn't care. Uh, oh, what a devilish. Oh, what a devilish clown. Oh, <laughs> I gotta play him again. I know. So I want to get into that too. But I, before I get into that, is just the idea that with. With this film, I, one thing that I found really interesting is the the opening quote that that you know we have with the film in terms of I, I know I'm paraphrasing I don't have the exact like quote but for for all intents and purposes you know uh, with the guise of a clown essentially you know it, clowns can get in the way with essentially anything. And so That's I found right. that interesting with, you know, something to have in my back of my head as you're watching, you know, this this film, you know, uh, uh, take shape. And it's interesting how that shapes into certain circumstances and situations where under normal circumstances, under a different context, it would send off alarm bells in the person's mind. But because under the context of them, you know, the the folks you know, you you and your band, so to speak, uh, um, being clowns, a lot of it is is uh, a lot of they, they look past a lot of things that otherwise would send alarm bells in their head. Right. So can you can you talk a bit also about that? And when, when you when you were when you had the script there, just that idea of that that concept that 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 was, you know, it was interesting of them trying to trying to play with that of of how uh, under the context of being a clown it yes. has it may have a different look i and i and i like to play with voices and i asked billy if he would let me try uh using two voices for papa one his you know welcome to the greatest show on earth and one where he's just papa corn just talking to you like this um where i think there's one where he says Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, um, he's got Donald filling out a uh, 
he says Donald won a prize. And uh, so he's got to fill out his home address and stuff like that. And Donald says, you know, he says, I'll need your address if we're going to come, you know, if we're going to come and bring you the prize. Right. And, and Donald's like, do you really need this? And I'm like, look, man, I'm just trying to do my job. Stop busting my balls. And, and, and I think that helped too, because when someone is talking to you like this, Brandon, I mean, yeah, you might be a little freaked out, but you're kind of like, yeah, this is a show. It's a show. But right. then when he drops it, that's when it's really scary. When he's like, hey, what are you doing? Then you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and we, we were just talking about it a moment ago, uh, getting into the possibility of a, of a sequel over, you know, a decade later. Um, can you talk also about that of, uh, as you said, it was difficult to really, to to dive into this character and yes. the possibility of you know well no the likelihood let's forget the possibility the likelihood that you're going to dive back into the the swamp of this character so to speak uh it is a swamp that is such a good way to put it and so yeah pond's gonna do it it'll definitely happen yeah. so billy wrote me and he's like you know back the subject line was back to the circus and i was like when I saw the subject line really seriously, I was like, oh, shit. Because <laughs> I knew this might happen. And I knew I can't say no to Billy. And so I read it because I know him on a personal level, you know. And and I like him. And I, I really want things to that he does to succeed. And I thought about it before, like a day before I responded. And I was like, you cannot tell him anything but yes. And so I said... You know, yeah, but you have to be there with me as much as you were the first time, or I can't do it. Yeah. So yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, I understand that there's also a contest that's being run. Um, for yeah, this sequel. So people wrote both Billy and me and all of the other clowns, and after Circus of the Dead, there were all of the circus fanboys and girls who would write and say, I want to be killed in the next one. I want to be killed in the sequel. So sure enough, he's got a uh, contest where you can either, you can say, I want to join the cast and crew, or I want to be in the movie and be killed. And you send in all your information in a video and stuff like that. If you just Google Circus of the Dead 2. Yep, I got it up. Choose your path. Oh, great. Have a link up. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, and lots of people have done it. And then they write me on Facebook and like, Hey, I entered the contest. I was like, dude, I have no pull. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just an actor. But um, yeah, it's going to be fun. We'll have somebody on set and probably somebody on the crew who is from this contest. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Why does everybody want to be killed on screen? Why does everybody really like that? I don't know. I guess if, if I'm picturing it as someone who is a, is a horror fan, I guess there is... Uh, it's something cool in watching it on screen because when you're when you're seeing how creative the the deaths can get in in a horror film, and you're like, oh, I was I was uh, you know I played a role in shaping that particular you know uh, particular uh, creative death or something like that. So maybe maybe that's what it is that 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 uh, you know folks find fascinating, I suppose. I I'm guess guessing. so. But man, people love to die on screen. It's like a rehearsal or something. Like, you know, like it makes it takes the real thing and makes it a little less scary because you're like, yeah, I've done that before. Could be, could be. Who knows, man? Who knows? Um, but, 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 but you know, um, um, Three from Hell. Yes. Was, was that, that wasn't 10 years ago. Was that five? I want to say that was, I want to say that was five. Uh, no, 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 no. I think that was longer, actually. Let, let me, let me. Six, seven, check. something. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. the point yeah. is, I, I died in that, and my, five, five. So half, half so of that. My, my and and my wife in that, or my partner in crime was Lucinda, who's Bill Mosley's wife. Yeah. And so uh, we were talking beforehand. I knew they would do a close up on somebody with a blood cannon. Where they shoot the blood right in your face, and, it, and I, they were told it's Lucinda, and I was like, "Thank God," 
because I've died so many times on screen and they use, and they shoot the blood cannon, they, it can get in your eyes and yes. it really, really burns. And I was like, Woohoo! you had the blood cannon and I didn't. So once you've died like 20 times, then you're like, yeah, if I die, I don't really want to be messy. I don't want to lay in cold blood when it's going to be really freezing. And then you have to be in the shot, like laying in the blood in the middle of the night. So whenever they want to kill me, I just did this on a movie, in fact, <laughs> where I'm shot. I'm like, guys, you could save a lot of money if you don't do the splatter, don't do the blood, but just let me sort of like, oh, and then I'm dip out of, out of the frame and I'm gone. Because then I know that if I have to be seen in the background, I'm not going to be laying in cold ass blood because that <laughs> stuff gets really cold in the middle of the night. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, a lot of people don't take you kind of take this for granted. If if you have haven't had a chance to do it yourself, and, and I mean, it's it's fun to watch it on screen, but to actually do it, uh, you know, people kind of take for granted what the what the climate is when when you are actually on set. Sometimes it could be very hot where you are, where it's like summertime, and then it could yes. be like bone chilling cold. So. I did um, uh, Justin Moorhead and uh, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. I did one of their films, uh, Synchronic. Okay. And it was a battle. It was a, like a time travel thing. So it was the Battle of New Orleans, the War of 18, whatever, 1812 or whatever. So we were in we were in New Orleans, Louisiana, somewhere in Louisiana. Anyway, it was an open, like open field. And um, you've got all of these extras and they're laying there in just in, in blood and with, you know, guts hanging out and stuff like that. It was really cold ass. It was a cold ass night. And so most of these guys had not done it before. They just saw the ad for like, oh, you know, be in the movies. <laughs> and so I asked one of them, I said, oh, man, are you OK? Are you all right? He was like, yeah, I'm great. I'm in a movie. I was like, yeah, you do 50 of them and uh, that'll take the bloom off that rose. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, Bill, um, always a pleasure to have you on, man. Um, always, you know, a pleasure to kind of, you know, uh, dive into to, you know, uh, uh, actor speaks, so to speak. Um, I know sometimes with, with some of my viewers here, they're like, what are you guys talking about? But I, I, I can't help it. I have to like, I have to dive in as, as someone who has done, done that in the past. It is, it's also, you know, fascinating to, you know, get into the head space of, of figuring out, okay, how did you do that? How did that work? Um, so, uh, with that being said, before I let you go, can you tell folks where they can find you? Well, first, I want to say that you and I have to do something together. We got to be yes. in a movie together. Yeah. So, yeah, producers, indeed. directors, these two, movie together. Like, yeah, make that happen. Um, if people want to find this, I'm <laughs> at Bill. <laughs> I'm at Bill Overs Jr. Uh, on all of the things online, and yeah, I do my little social media. I don't do it every day. But I, uh, yeah, I do stuff and, and I answer messages and stuff like that. And so, yeah, cool. I'm at Bill Oberst Jr. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank so you. there you guys have it. Um, again, I want to thank Bill Oberst Jr. once again uh, to hop onto the show and, you know, talk, talk a little bit about, you know, uh, some anniversaries that are celebrated with uh, 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 films and shows, TV shows in his, in his uh, uh, body of work in his career thus far. I'm sure I'm going to have him back for other um, additional anniversaries that will be coming up. Um, I'm your host, Brandon Choi, uh, also co-creator of Movers and Shakers Unlimited. You can find me at Brandon Choi ENT on X. And then, of course, Brandon Choi underscore ENT on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be safe out there and uh, see you soon, guys. Bye now.